The title of my sermon today is Sin's Slippery Slope and God's Love. That pretty much describes life today and life in all times. Uh, we dabble with sin and the back end of the car starts fish telling. And our only hope is God's love. I'll take my scripture from Romans chapter 11 verses 1 through 10. The main idea is that the progression of sin, nobody tells a white lie and sets a limit there and says that's, that's as far as I'm going to go with sinfulness. It's a progression that pulls us deeper and deeper. The progression of sin often holds us in bondage. I, you know what? Probably always holds us in bondage would be closer to the truth. But God does not give up on humankind. Now the focus of this scripture is the nation of Israel. And as I've said, nation of Israel is an example, especially to us who are part of a religion. That, that we, are, we are Christian, Southern Baptists, we go to church together, so that's practicing a religion. And they are an example to us. And that's the kind of the angle we'll take today of Israel's example. But before we do, I want you to think a minute about the universe and how big it is. And it's spinning. All of it is spinning. It's spinning together and it's spinning apart. It's getting bigger. As best we can tell in our limited view of things, it is 20 billion light years across. That's a light year is how far light will travel in a year. You know, light travels so fast that if I shot a beam of light, if I could do it and shoot it and it would go around the whole planet Earth and come back by my ear, it would go around seven times a second. That's how fast it travels. And a light year is how far it travels going that speed in a year. And we estimate the universe is 20, what we can perceive of it, is 20 billion light years across. That's inconceivable. And you know, it is in the palm of God's hand. God created that. He holds it. And he is working a plan in that. Now we, <laughs> that's, um, unless you've got a, a bigger brain, better brain, way better brain than mine, you can't really, we can't really conceive of that. But God is in control of that. Unbelievably massive thing. But what about me? How much control do I have? And let's go ahead and admit, once you get off planet Earth, we have no control at all in any way. How much control does the United States, the United States government is very wealthy, very powerful. How much control do they have over the cosmos? None. How much control do we have over the government? Well, a teeny, teeny, tiny little bit. We still have a teeny, tiny little bit. But, but it is insignificant. Today as we go through this scripture, I want you to think about where it is, at what point do you begin to have control of something. Does that make sense? Does the question make sense? The people of Israel, this is very important. I want you to, I want you to hear what I'm saying here. The people of Israel are real people. They're ancient people. They exist in the world today. Not only are they sneaking around among us, they're not sneaking. Some of them, I say that because not all people that are Israelites actually realize that they're Israelites because they have been dispersed. But they're around in the world today. But they're real people. And not only that, a lot of them live in one place. You know what I'm talking about, New York City. But also, and I say that, to make a joke, but there are actually more Jewish people in New York City than in Israel. And so they're in Israel. And you know what? Israel is the promised land. And I am, as far as I can tell you, years of study and thought and listening to really intelligent people, where the nation of Israel is is where the Garden of Eden was back in the day. But that's a reality that connects us to the Bible, doesn't it? It talks about it at the beginning of the book, and there they see it. And 
you know that there's no other religion if we just reduce what we're doing here this morning to religion and we separate a little bit from the faith that is the key to it all. There is no other religion in the world that has a physical connection to their founding people principle. Uh, not people. They do have connection to people, but they don't have a remnant of the ancient people that is still there. I don't know how, how, how clear that was. They connect humanity to the biblical period. That's the point that I'm getting at. We have a physical connection to the biblical period. And as we look at the scripture in Romans, and I always want to keep in focus, Paul's meaning is to talk about the Israelites and how they have rejected the Messiah and what the consequences of that is. But they are also a mirror to us, as I've said in previous weeks, to look at ourselves and to look at God. So God's dealing with Israel, just a review in chapter 9. We talked about the past dealing, the Old Testament dealing with Israel, that they were elected as a special people with a special mission. They were to become holy. They were to worship God and become holy because a man is going to be born among them that's going to fix things, going to fix a sin problem, and they needed to be a holy people for that reason. The, in chapter 10, we look at God's present dealings with Israel, the fact old that the Old Testament religion rolled into the cross, that the, the Old Testament was always on a trajectory taking it to the cross. The Messiah was going to come and he was going to die on the cross. But Israel rejected that. When, it, when the paycheck came, they worked all week, and when the paycheck came, they said, I'm not interested in the paycheck. By and large. And so today we're going to look at three examples from Israel's faith journey that we can learn something about ourselves in that. So the first one is that though they have rejected the Messiah, God is not done with Israel. Paul mourns for them. We saw it in chapter 14 of chapter 10, uh, verse 14 of chapter 10. How then shall the Israelites call on Jesus in whom they have not believed? They didn't believe he was the Messiah. And I will say in my own spiritual experience, I've heard parts of my testimony almost on a weekly basis for the last four years. God does not let anyone go easily. If I can testify to nothing else, I will say that if a human was deciding on my salvation, they would have cut me loose because of my things that I've done. But God gives me second chance and third chance and so forth, okay? There is no example in the Bible, not one, not one. If you find one, I'll throw my Bible away, where a person turns to God in repentance and God rejects him. It doesn't happen. And that's what turned me, you know that too. I read the Old Testament, not a single repentant person was rejected, ever. God is a God, don't matter what you've done this week, you repent today and he'll receive you back and begin working with you. God's personality is revealed in this next scripture, verse 21, but to Israel he says, and this is quoting the Old Testament, all day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Come home, he says, come back. So Israel's rejection is not total. We go to chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says, I say then, has God cast away his people Israel? Certainly not. And this in, in the Greek, this is uh, uh, meganito. This is a, a very strongly worded, certainly not, by no means, may it never be so, absolutely not. Paul says, for example, I'm an Israelite, the seed of Abraham in the tribe of Benjamin, and, and I was walking away from God and using Judaism as my excuse, and he came to me on the Damascus road, and he called me back. He stretched out his arm to me. This is a testimony, and this is a man that loves the Jewish nation. And he says, I was going the wrong way, and God took hold of my heart, and he turned me around. 
and you can do the same. Doesn't matter what you've done this week. Turn around today. God, in other words, Paul was saying, they have God has treated Israel like me, and I say the same thing. When I rejected God in my lifetime, and I'm talking literally when I rejected God in favor of things that I, subjective things that I built in my brain, and I favored my brain, my feelings over God who created me, when I rejected him, he did not reject me. And the Bible says he didn't reject you either. There's nobody that can hear this that is finally rejected. So, though they reject the Messiah, God is not done with you. The second example that Israel gives us, though we might feel alone in our faith, we are never alone. We are never alone. Alone. Romans 11, 2 and 3, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scriptures say about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets, they've torn down your altars, and I alone am left and they seek to kill me. Elijah in his time stood all alone for God. Israel said, well, you know, this Yahweh is a little bit outdated. The pagans around us, the Baal worshipers, and Baal just means Lord in Canaanite. They called their God Lord, like the Israelites did. And they said, so that's not that odd. That's not that different. This other group is not that different than us, but they're more modern. They have better technology. They play better music. Whatever, however you want, whatever analogy you want to make, we like what they do. And so we're just going to embrace their gods. We still love Yahweh, maybe, sort of, in words. But we're going to go along with the crowd. And Elijah was left alone. And though he had defeated, you know the story where they, where they caught, he called down fire on his sacrifice and, the, the, and God rejected the Baal sacrifice, and he publicly, very publicly, defeated the prophets of Baal, still Elijah felt despair because he's human. He felt all alone. Do you ever feel alone in your Christian walk? And the answer is yes. And in part, unfortunately, that's a spiritual problem. Not, not totally, but it, part of it. We always need spiritual growth. As I've said, you can't tread water in your faith. You either swim forward or you go down. Jesus needs to be our portion. We need to have as a goal to get to the place where Jesus is enough. If we are the only Christian on the earth, me, Jesus is enough. That's our goal. Unfortunately, we're human. We're not, probably not going to be able to get there totally. But look what it says in John 14, verses 16 to 18. These are the words of Jesus. This is a promise of Jesus, your Savior, who died for you. He said, I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper when I'm gone. Another place, he says, it'll be better for you to have the Holy Spirit than it is to have me physically here. Because when I'm physically here... You focus on my bag of bones, my body, the way my breath smells, whatever, human things. And when the Holy Spirit is there, you can focus on spiritual things. And kind of the problem is focusing on human things all the time. He says it'll be better. He says this helper, um, he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. There's not going to be a time that the Holy Spirit will not be available to a Christian. Though you ignore him... He is waiting patiently there beside you. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Very important. They cannot receive the Holy Spirit until they make Jesus Lord. Because it neither sees the Holy Spirit nor knows him. But you know him. You should know him. 
for he dwells with you and will be with you always. I will not leave you orphans. Jesus said, this is a promise of Jesus. Put it in your pocket. Carry it with you daily. I will come to you. Say that again. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you in spirit. On the other hand, being lonely can be very normal. That's why we have church. Humans are gregarious. That's a 50 cent word. It means we like to be part of a team, part of a family. Uh, we have a herd mentality as human beings. That is normal and natural. Uh, we innately need one another. We need to help one another. We need to be accountable to one another. We need church. It serves a purpose in our life. And that is because we need one another. In Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, it says, let us, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Why do we have church? To stir up love in the name of Christ and good works. We're not saved by those good works, but they're important. We represent Jesus' love. We represent one another. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That is, stop, not stopping coming to church, as is the manner of some, but in exhorting one another. And look at this last phrase. I don't think I need to give a lot of reasons to think that this is, might be soon. And so much more as we see the day approaching. Does anybody besides me see the day approaching? I know we're getting closer, not further away from it. That much I can say 100%. So humans are gregarious. Also, I believe us being together in our faith is part of the image of God. Part of the image of God. In Genesis 126, God said, let us make man in our image. So there is a plurality in the image of God. It says male and female, he created them. I think the base need that all humans have is, is for a spouse uh, to, to be with and to complement with. Uh, but this is part of our design. Our need for one another reflects the image of God. So even when we reject God, he does not reject us and we need, we are never alone. The third point that I would make is that sin is deadly dangerous to us, but God is working a plan. We got to keep that in focus. Even when the, the world goes to hell in a handbasket, to coin a phrase, God is working a plan. And we want to be a part of that plan, not the chaos. Romans 11, 4 and 5. What, but what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself, he said this in the Old Testament, myself 7,000 men who have not bowed a, the knee to Baal. This is to Elijah. Even so, at this present time, the time of Paul, there is a remnant according to the election of grace, that is, Christian Jews. Now, we may think there, there, there may, it may feel like there's a very small number of Christian Jews, but if when you consider there are only about 15 million Jews in the world, and there are about almost 8 billion people, there is most likely at least as big, if not a greater percentage, of Jews that are Christians than the general population. And so God is preserving a remnant who have accepted the Messiah. The, the God's work among the Jews has not disappeared, but we're talking by and large when we say that the Israelites have rejected, by and large. For us to survive and thrive in our Christian walk, we must balance our personal feelings. Is God making us feel better? And our personal needs. Is God providing me what I need with God's greater plan? We have to have a balance between those two things. If God only meets our needs, we are self-centered. And if that's our only concern, we are concerned about ourselves and not about God's work. We have to balance those two. The remnant of the Christian Messianic Jews Accept Jesus in the same way that Gentiles do. 
And in the same way, if they reject, they are in trouble, just like Gentiles. Verse 6 says, if salvation is by grace, then it is no longer by the works of religion, by being good, following our religion. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Grace is an undeserved gift. But if it is of works, it is no longer by grace. You can't have both. Christianity is the world religion that, that at least doctrinally says salvation only comes by grace. All the rest say work. And this scripture says it's one or the other. can't be both. Okay? And so I would say again to you, if you, if you straddle on the fence, either, either Christianity is the only way to God or it's no way at all. But it's not both. Otherwise, work is no longer work. So salvation is not by works or religion. It's what's in your heart. It is by grace, which is an undeserved gift. It's given by God. So God is not surprised by the world today, right? God is in control. And though it is very surprising to me as I look around the world, very odd to me, I don't know what to think about anything hardly. Now, if you've got several hours, I'll give you my opinion. But I don't really know anything. <laughs> I'm bamboozled by all this, but God is not. Verses 7 and 8. What then? Israel has obtained what it Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it. That remnant has obtained salvation, and the rest were blinded. It was made as plain as the nose on their face, and they did not see it. Just as it was written, is God surprised that they rejected it? God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. Now, we could preach on this for a long time, and I, I did have a bunch of slides on this, and I decided that we'll, we'll, we'll seek a summary here this week. Verse 9 goes on to say, And David says, Let their table, this is religion, become a snare, the great Passover feast, and a trap, and a stumbling block to them, and a recompense to them. So as hard as they try through their feast and their religion, they're, it's just gonna, they're going to trip over it. It's only faith. Remember, Israel had been told very clearly in the Old Testament, God is sending a Messiah. It has always been about faith, never about religion, never about what you do. The Messiah will take the punishments for sin. And God foretold that Israel would reject the Messiah when he came. None of this is surprising. Should not surprise anybody. Taken all together, the scripture emphasized that God is just. He's given clear and repeated warnings and consequences. And it says in, in Romans 1, no one, should, no one is ignorant. Everyone is responsible. Uh, it also, the Bible tells us that man is willful with a self-serving intentionality to disobey. And once they have disobeyed God, then they rationalize, bend it. They bend what they did to their favor. What we, do, we bend what we do to our favor and make God the one guilty. And from similar passages, we see that God does not change human minds, but he hardens their resolve to do what they want to do. In other words, let me just summarize all that. We can, if you want to come, again, if you have several hours and want to open this can of worms with me, we'll, we will, we, I will exhaust you with what I think. How about that? I promise. In other words, putting all this together, God knows the truth about you and he loves you anyway. That's it. Sum it up. He knows what you're going to do. He knows what you've done. He loves you anyway. Enough to become and let you spit on him and go to the cross for you. What happens when one rejects the Messiah and chooses religion? You should know this by now. Verse 10 says, let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bound down their back all." I have to go through the progression of sin because Paul is, in one way it seems like we are in the midst of a forest. In another, in another way, as you go through Romans, 
there's a number on every tree. Just follow it down the line. It's, it's, he, he, so we are coming back to Romans 1 here when he says our eyes are darkened. Let me go through that real quick. In verse 17 of Romans 1, it tells us the just shall live by faith. Those that are justified are justified because of their faith. Wrath is coming for those who reject God and who reject righteousness. Verse 18. Not only do people reject, not only do they say that's not for me, but they suppress the truth about God. If I am not embracing salvation, I'm going to put it down. And I'm going to try to make you feel like a fool for taking it up. Uh, he told us in verse 19 that truth is known or at least Strongly suspected by all people. Five from verse 20, sin begins as self-centeredness. Not really, I'm not thinking about you, I'm just thinking about what's good for me. But it comes willful rejection of God. And if God doesn't like my self-centeredness, he can step off. Number six, we are all without excuse for rejecting God. For what can be known about God is inherent in us. Number seven, it began simply by not glorifying and being thankful to God as he made the universe and made us a little part of it. But soon we start with not glorifying, not being thankful, but before we know it, we filled up that void of God as we pushed him out with worldly stuff, with stuff, all kind of stuff. And our thoughts, as we take our mind off what we were created to have our mind on and put it on other things and other people and other situations and whatever, then all our thoughts begin to get mixed up and futile and chaotic. Verse 21. And then, and this is where we plug into that Old Testament scripture, our hearts become darkened. Have you ever been in a place and you realize, whew, I'm in a bad place. I'm, I'm feeling dark. I'm feeling dark. Elijah spoke to God personally. I believe Elijah got in a dark place. Now, I, don't, I think this is talking about something different, though, so let me not, get, let me not go down that rabbit hole. Uh, this is talking about when we have let ourselves be carried away by sin, and all of a sudden we crave wickedness. That's what this is talking about. Number nine, verse 22, thinking themselves so smart and so wise and so I've got this all figured out, they make fools of themselves before God. Have you ever made a fool of yourself before God? Verse 23 tells us, rather than worshiping God, they worship what they can achieve for themselves. What they can make with their own hands. What they can conceive of. Number 11, verse 24 says, God eventually, and this is pitiful place to be. This is a terrible, terrible place to be. Eventually, God gives them up to uncleanliness and lust. I believe this is when you stop feeling guilty about whatever it is you're doing. When you sneak down into the, the basement of your heart and go in that little dark room that nobody but you knows about. When you don't, at this point, you don't feel bad about it anymore. And then, number 12, verse 25, Romans 1, 25, evil becomes good in their mind. Do I need to give any modern day examples of this to anybody? That's not, that's not evil. That's good. That's something to be celebrated. And it's only your whatever negative thing that causes you to criticize this wonderful thing. If you don't, I have nothing else to say. Go back and read Romans 1 and think about your world today. The, this slippery slope of sin is deadly, deadly dangerous. 
and it is dangerous to us all. James put it this way, James, the brother of Jesus, in James 1, 14 and 15, look at this progression, but each one of us starts out just tempted. Hmm, that is that makes me curious. You know, the, at first, sin, I've heard people talk about that. That's curious to me. Then we are drawn away. We know what's right. We know what our responsibilities are. But that curiosity is pulling us away from our responsibilities. I could give all kinds of examples of this. I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm curious about that. I don't want to do it. I'm curious about that. By his own desires, he is enticed. That's an elevation of that temptation. Maybe, maybe one time trying this. Then when desire has conceived and you act on your desire, it gives birth to sin in your life and sin begins to grow and grow. And not only, eventually, very quickly, it's not what you do, it becomes who you are. You were in the image of God and now you're in the image of your lust. And what does that bring to us? Spiritual death. We have completely hijacked the life that God gave us, loaned to us, and we're driving it to destruction. So, Israel is, gives us examples to look at ourselves, as I said, and these are the truths. We reject Jesus daily, but good news, he pursues us still, all of us. We might feel alone, but we are not. If you are all alone, that's a loneliness inside of you, not spiritually outside of you. The Holy Spirit is there. You know, we, me and Sarah watched something a week or two ago about an uh, asteroid hitting in Russia. There are asteroids flying at our planet all the time. And if you don't believe me, go to Winslow, Arizona. There's a big hole in the ground there where one is hit. They say the dinosaurs were wiped out by a big asteroid. So far in human history, God has seen fit to knock them out of the way. We exist in a very narrow window of existence. They, they say if the planet, if the average orbit was a foot further out from the sun or a foot closer to the sun, that all life on earth would end, life that we know would end. We're not in control of that. And as I said at the beginning, we have a little tiny, teeny, tiny bit of control when it comes to our government. We need to do what we can there. But even then, our government cannot control the cosmos. But according to the scripture today, what do you have control of? A little bit. If you rely on the Holy Spirit, you have control of you. And the Bible tells us to fear sin, to flee from it. But to remember that God's desire, with the help of the Holy Spirit, is to work a plan inside of you. And there is where you have a small measure of control. And so as we pray, pray for God to show you, hold the mirror up to you, and show you where you need to be putting some intentionality and some effort uh, to be a part of his plan in this world today. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that salvation is available to all people. Lord, we thank you that no matter how hard we sin, that you call us back. Lord, I pray that we all return to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand.